I begin with my own personal experience, and that may take a little bit of time to unfold, so please allow me. Only because personal experience leads to knowledge. So, I was in Japan 2016 June to 2017 July. In November 2016, I, I saw three surviving frag fragments, now national treasures of the 13th century picture scroll of the tale of Genji. Here is the PowerPoint. I actually saw this one uh, at the Tokugawa Museum in Nagoya. I was touched and moved by the surviving fragments coming down to us all the way from the early period of Japanese painting. In 2017, from mid-January to the entire month of February, a fantastic exhibition, Masterpieces of Japanese Painting from Eisei Bunko Museum was staged in two parts at the Nagoya City Fine Arts Museum. Eisei Bunko houses the collections of the late Prince Hosokawa Moritatsu, who was also a friend of Titi Suzuki. I went back to see the <coughs> exhibition twice, surrounded by the masterpieces of Japanese paintings, such, such as by Hishida Shunso and works by Yokoyama Taikan, I felt that some invisible veil was hanging over my eyes due to my, precisely due to my ignorance of Japanese paintings. I so dearly wished to remove this veil. Fortunately, the exhibition catalog contained an excellent section on technical details that explain the making of some of these paintings on display. And I began reading that section with earnest interest. La primera parte de esta exposición habla sobre su propia experiencia. Entre los años 2017, 2016 y 2016, eh, vio algunos de los fragmentos del de cuento de Genji, justo como muestra aquí en la pantalla esta, esta fotografía. Estos fragmentos se encontraban en el Museo de Tokugawa en la ciudad de Nagoya. Entonces, frente, al, frente a la exhibición eh, mostrada por Tokugawa, ella presenciaba su ignorancia, no tenía detalles y, le, y se, se dedicaba a investigar sobre eso. A minor breakthrough came to me on the 30th of May, 2017. At that time, Professor Rebecca Maldonado was staying at Nanzan, and you actually went to this uh, exhibition and inspired me to go. So, I took a day off from my research and traveled to the Toyota Mu uh, Municipal Museum of Art, north of Nagoya, to see the exhibition, Higashiyama Kai Tosho Daijin Miedo, uh, Sho Shoheki Gaten, an exhibition on, of the mural paintings by the painter Higashiyama Kai, who dedicated these murals to the temple Tosho Daiji in Nara, in the memory of priest Ganjin. Ganji was a Chinese priest who traveled to, uh, who traveled from China to Japan to transmit the knowledge and details of formal ordination practice, or kairitsu, upon the invitation of the Japanese emperor. In 759, he founded his temple Tosho Daiji in Nara to train Japanese priests. In 2016-17, to Tosho Daiji was undergoing a complete refurbishing, and the mural screens were removed from the uh, three rooms of the temple. The Japanese people, some Japanese people who had money to shake, <laughs> shake and do that, they wisely decided to share, uh, share these uh, wealthy wealth of uh, murals with the rest of Japan with those who were interested in seeing them. And public exhibitions were organized at two, uh, at least in two or maybe three major cities in Japan, uh, starting with Toyota. The exhibition reconstructed these three large halls of the temple and fitted them, those murals. This is how they looked when they were in the temple. Uh, they reconstructed each room so that the viewer can experience what the artist envisioned and strove to achieve. The exhibition was designed in such a way for the, for the viewer to trace the footsteps of the painter, Higashiya Makai, 
both in Japan and China. In China, Higashiyama visited places that priest Ganji most likely had seen and grew up in. It is to be noted that Ganjin the priest lost his eyesight by 751 before he came to Japan. On account of the difficult and repeated attempts at the sea voyage to cross the sea from China to Japan. By the time Ganjin finally arrived on the southern coast of Kyushu upon his sixth attempt, he was unable to see anything on the new land that he set his foot on. Higashiyama identified himself with the blinded Ganjin and imagined what might have, have crossed this blind monk's uh, mental screen from day to day. He wanted to pay tribute to Ganjin, but also offer consolation by recreating the scenes from Chinese mountains and Ganjin's birthplace, Yoshu or Yangjiao. Done basically in this particular part, done basically in black and white Sumie style. Oh, this is the installation, and this is the Chinese uh, scene because Ganjin could no longer see anything, but maybe he remembered some imagery. And uh, he, uh, uh, the artist, chose Sumie style. Um, and, uh, and other two rooms with Japanese landscape of sea coast and deep ocean. Uh, deep mountain and clouds. So I'm going to take you from this one is the sea coast and this is the Ganjin. And here is the painting that I want to dwell on for a minute or two. His paintings were a fitting tribute to the tenacious spiritual commitment of Ganjin the Bodhisattva. As I progressed from one room to the next, and as I imagined, Ganjin's inner experience as interpreted and depicted by Higashiyama, the experience of crossing the rough sea, leaving behind his native land, and meeting the demands of a new life as a court-appointed ordination master, and now as a blind man, I found myself strongly moved. By the time I entered this third room, I was possessed by the art of the painter. If there is a moment that my ha heartbeat skipped, it was then, when I was in this room, darkly lit, with the fine Fusuma painting, sliding doors, that had a painting of a deep mountain scene in the dusk, with the rising mist forming into clouds, mist turning into clouds. Mountain trees quietly whispered in the misty atmosphere, I turned to the explanation on the wall, a quotation of Higashiyama's own words, which read to the effect. Now Higashiyama explaining the hardest part for him to do this painting. I paid my utmost attention to the in-between that Raquel talked about, in-between, from the trees to the mist. In order to depict this, I carefully roasted the pigments made of grand natural stones to achieve the right tone of dark darkness. I looked at the painting again. I turned my gaze back to the painting again. And lo, I, I began to understand and felt the technical detailed attention that went into making the most natural and understated part of the painting. The artist captured the ineffable the in, invisible in his visual representation. Los murales que estaban en este templo fue, era lo que se, se exhibía. 
y en, en algunas ciudades principales de Japón, por ejemplo en la ciudad de Toyota. ¿Sí? Estos murales que se veían, se veía el artista como pintaba el Higashiyama. Higashiyama este, es una montaña este, especial para, en las ordenaciones budistas, pero también nos muestra la profesora se siente inundada de la, del sentimiento que pudo haber tenido Ganji, que, que después de su sexto intento logra venir a, logra llegar a Japón para hacer la transmisión de, la, eh, de las ordenaciones budistas, pero también perdió la vista. Entonces, con todas esas eh, condiciones de su existencia, eh, es con, cómo ha de haber visto Ganji también estos murales y cómo también él estaba haciendo una contribución para China. Entonces, eh, algunas de estas pinturas son también en la China, y, y es como, como la refleja en otros, en otros dos cuartos de, de las exhibiciones que tiene. ¿Qué es lo que se muestra? La experiencia interior del Bodhisattva en este Higashiyama, y recordando una nueva vida que ahora incluso él casi está perdiendo la vida casi la vista y ahí mismo, ¿no? perdiendo la vida. Ella estaba, en, al ver estas pinturas, se sentía poseída, veía las profundas montañas y la niebla, y era esa explicación lo que quería dar. El Higashiyama muestra lo que hablaba la profesora eh, Raquel al, en la mañana, ese entre de los árboles, entre los árboles y la niebla, lo que el artista muestra es ese entre. ¿Cómo logró tener ese tono en la oscuridad? Entonces empecé a entender lo difícil de la técnica y cómo lo podía captar el, el artista. El artista lograba captar lo inefable. Now uh, I'm moving to the main part of my uh, discussion. Uh, painting as containing the zeitgeist. Of the day. So, Nishida Kitaro observed uh, that not only artworks such as literature, sculpture, painting, architecture, music, uh, not only artworks reflect the spirit, spirit of the day, the zeitgeist. We find uh, that, that he mentions to his friend uh, Fujioka Sakitaro, who just completed a book on the recent history of Japanese uh, uh, paintings up to modern times, and published in 1903. And immediately, 10 days later, uh, he wrote to Fujioka a very critical letter, which I'm going to uh, share with you in full. But I just wanted to uh, present to you the thesis that runs throughout my presentation for this afternoon. Paintings, just as literature, are the expression of the souls of the time. Thus they contain many points of the zeitgeist of the day and the condition of society of the time. As you know, the analysis by William Lübke, or William Lübke Grand uh, Vista Kunstgeschichte, 1860. So Nishida was reading up on all these Western aesthetic theories. As the analysis by Lübke shows, uh, he really seems to ex excel on this point to show the zeitgeist as the uh, uh, zeitgeist gets expressed in artworks. Entonces, como a través de la literatura, la escultura, en el arte también tienen estas versiones eh, críticas de la época. Entonces cita a Fujioka Sakutaro, eh, un texto que va, va a dar la crítica escrita en 1993. Y en, este, eh, en esta propuesta es como la pintura también expresa el tono de una época, es la crítica de la sociedad. En ese, en, en ese momento, bueno, también Nishida leía las teorías estéticas como la, la expresión artística que también está hablando de una época. And now my hypothesis is this. If that is the case, we could also find something common, in common between paintings done around that time, about 1910, and Nishida's uh, work, the first work, Zen no Kenkyu, or Inquiry into the Good. 
Entonces, la hipótesis es que tal vez podríamos encontrar algo en común en las pinturas de esta época con la, eh, la teoría de indagación sobre el bien de mi ciudad. So, I, ch I chose these two examples to highlight my um, hypothesis or to examine my own hypothesis. Um, just as Nishida's uh, earliest philosophical path was informed by his uh, reading of Western thinkers, including William James and Henri Bergson, uh, so were young Japanese painters uh, groping to find their own style and develop their techniques by discovering the native Japanese painting tradition as well as learning from Western paintings. Their endeavor was marked by dynamic interculturality, curiosity, and humility. This, I think, was the zeitgeist of this time. Dynamic interculturality, curiosity, and humility. Humility means sincere enthusiasm for genuine learning from the other. This was a zeitgeist of which paintings, just as literature, are ex expressions of as Nishida observed in his letter. So this is my hypothesis. Entonces, en la, la, lo, que le, lo que leía Nishida claro en ese tiempo era pues William James, Bergson, y también la lectura de los eh, jóvenes pintores, donde se notaba un espíritu de dinamismo, de curiosidad y de humildad, humildad en el sentido como sincero entusiasmo de aprender sobre el otro. Entonces, a partir de eso es que formula eh, la profesora su hipótesis. ¿Cómo va a ser este pensamiento artístico que corresponde, este movimiento artístico que corresponde con el pensamiento de Nishida? In the following discussion, I just, uh, I'm going to do the following. <laughs> First, I will uh, share with you Nishida's letter to Fujioka, dated uh, 1903. Next, uh, I will uh, uh, Turn to Shunso, the painter who did the black cat. Shunso and Yoko Yamataikan uh, to show from artist's point of view what they were trying to achieve. And I think there is a lot of uh, commonality uh, with, uh, say, Nasme Soseki's thesis of uh, um, humanity and so around that time. So I'm going to point out a little bit of that. And then I will quote very briefly Nasme Soseki, his statement, because he went to critique one of these uh, Bunten uh, exhibitions, annual exhibitions, and I think it is uh, relevant. And then uh, I will go into the technicality that these uh, artists were developing because it, in response to Nishida's own questions that he asked of Fujioka. Bueno, lo que voy a hacer, lo que va a hacer la profesora es primero leer la carta de Fujioka, es este manifiesto, después va a explicar sobre la pintura de Shonzo, sobre el gato negro, y explicar el punto de vista que tiene el artista en común eh, con este pensamiento, va a dar algunas citas relevantes y eh, explicar cómo tiene relación eh, la, la proposición de Fujioka con Nishida. In order to talk about this, we need to do some background uh, work. So I'm going to make a kind of a pedantic, but I hope not, uh, uh, look into the formation of modern painting world, uh, which has never been presented in itself, so to speak. It's always layered with uh, the, uh, like uh, nationalism or Hegelian or this. I'm not get doing that. I'm completely getting rid of those labels. Try to look at Tenshin, his disciples, Fenorosa, everybody as I encounter them. So that's my methodology. So let me talk first, begin with Okakura Tenshin. Entonces, bueno, hay que ver un poco los antecedentes. Pero aunque siempre se lee como un poco de nacionalismo, vamos a quitar eso de lado y vamos a ver es, eh, a Okakura Tenshin y a sus discípulos cómo han sido estos encuentros. So, Okakura Tenshin, I gave you some dates and stuff. So, he was born seven years before Nishida and Diti Suzuki, and he died at the age of uh, quite young. So, he didn't fulfill his uh, very rich potential ability, but he did quite an amazing thing. 
and uh, I, I am discovering him, and I'm getting very excited by my discovery, and just uh, some cut and dried uh, facts are that he was the first principal of the uh, Tokyo School of Fine Arts, which is today's Tokyo Geida, Geijutsu Daigaku, Tokyo University of Fine Arts. In 1887, he became the president. He also founded it. And also, uh, there was a scandal involving Kuki Shuzo's mother, who fell in love with Okakura Tenshi. And uh, some strange letter was circulated, and uh, there it became a kind of a scandal. So Okakura Tenshi said, OK, I'm going to step down from everything. And then his disciples all stepped down from the professorship at the university. So they all came with Tenshi. And so he said, OK, let's found another uh, institute. So they found the Japan Art Academy, uh, Nippon Gijusuin, in 1898. <laughs> Y a raíz de esto, pues él renuncia a la universidad, pero también sus discípulos salieron de ahí con él y fundaron una nueva academia en el año de 1918. So, what stands out about Tenshin's contribution is his global perspective, nurtured by his own travels. He uh, went to China, India, European capital cities such as Paris, London, Vienna and to the United States, New York, and Boston. And finally, he was invited by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts to become its uh, uh, section head of East Asian collections. So uh, that's the first perspective, I mean, global perspective. That is very unique retention. Second is his interdisciplinary interests, including, including religions, and not only arts, but uh, religions. And not only was he a poet himself, he was also a painter, writer, visionary, educator, administrator, museum curator, and even a governmental official for a while. <laughs> He's also known for his book, The Book of Tea, which kept, kept his earlier books written in English, The Ideals of the East and the Awakening of Japan. To me, what is remarkable about Tenshin is his expansive attitude towards the other, towards the different. He was open, generous, and perceptive to other cultures than Japan. He exposed his disciples to the Indian and Euro-American cultures by taking them along with him or sending them to, or, on the governmental sponsored uh, study abroad uh, program. In today's parlance, Tenshin practiced intercultural dialogue throughout his life. So the core uh, members, I'm going to talk, to talk about the core members of Tenshin's disciples. There were three or four more, maybe, but they were the first generation disciples. Their core members of the Tenshin's Academy, Yokoyama Taikan, uh, Hichida Shunso, and Shimomura Ka Kanzan, each had the opportunity to travel abroad and see other forms of paintings firsthand. Taikan and Shunso were dispatched by Okamura to India in 1902, and they made friends with the Tagore family, one of the Tagore's, uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, uh, relatives was a painter. 
Through him, uh, he got into Bengali painter, uh, they got into pen Bengali painter uh, networking, and Bengali painters wanted to learn from the Japanese techniques and so on. So there was already a very futile exchange going on. And Professor Inaga of, of Nichimunken wrote quite a lot on this, so I'm not going into it today. I just mentioned. Algunos de sus discípulos están aquí sus nombres, Kimura Bunsan y Hisida Shunso, Yokoyama Taikan y Shimomura Kansan. Ellos también eh, bueno, viajaron al extranjero y conocieron eh, algunos pintores bengalíes por este yeah, so the point is that uh, Tenshin not only wanted them to understand things intellectually, but no, they wanted them to see. He wanted them to see. That's very important. No? And so he took them. And how were they able to actually pay for their way? They painted as they went. Wherever they went, they painted their uh, paintings. And they sold very well. And they were able to pay their ways. And that's how they were uh, independent, and they were still able to see the world. Uh, yes. And this picture is very interesting. Fr closest to us is Kimura Buzan. He was not a very neat painter, so you can see his workstation quite, it, by Japanese standard, quite messy. <laughs> Next is Hishida Shunso, looking at Buzan working at work. Next is Yokoyama Taikan, he, and they are going to get you know, national treasure awards later in their lives. And further down is Shimobura Kanzan, and further down is Tenshin's office, and this is a studio at I, uh, Izura. I just wanted to show you how they, uh, in what posture they painted, and uh, what kind of workstations they had. So, and then the Shimomura Kanzan, the, way, the one at the very back, he was the first painter to receive the governmental scholarship, and uh, he went to England for two years. And uh, then he went to uh, six months kind of a uh, luxurious uh, sightseeing in France, Germany, and Italy before he returned home. So these guys all knew basically what was going, going on in the West. So as I mentioned already, they were in India and so on. So um, they were extremely talented painters because they kept on studying. They kept on perfecting their arts. They were never satisfied. So that's, uh, that's a market mark of these uh, guys who belong to Tenshin's uh, school. And also, um, they wanted to pursue how far a Japanese painting as a genre could go. And in their incessant quest, they maintain a global perspective of art as the expression of humanity, which is a universal uh, uh, characteristic. So unique and universal at the same time, and they were trying to push the limit in some way. And, and so, in their paintings, the spiritual, the material, and the technical all came together. To express the Japanese cultural sensitivity in their art was a natural component of the expressive activities. In other words, how do you express your Japanese experience? You cannot just say, we are global citizens, Japanese uh, experience doesn't matter. No, you need to do both, right? And they were doing it, and now here, uh, I, yesterday we went to Frida Kahlo's uh, uh, and uh, Diego's uh, exhibitions at the Dolores, uh, someone's uh, <laughs> wonderful foundation. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name. But uh, I realized similar uh, uh, endeavor was happening in Mexico 
in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s. And so it's a, there is something that we can really uh, take advantage of in the philosophy uh, study to see how the native and the universal are co-present. And as I said, I'm not uh, going to the root of, in order to explain their arts, I'm not going through the venue of nationalism or Hegelian idealism or anything, because they're only obfuscate the actual viewing experience. So I am following my own hunch, which is Nishida's pure experience in a sense. I'm applying his philosophy to my actual philosophizing. And this is just a little bit of uh, facts, which we don't need to go, really. And uh, so we just skip, yes. But I, just to show that I'm not uh, just making it up. These are actually the facts. Now, we need to pay homage to Ernest Fenarosa very briefly. He was one of the first uh, professors to come to the Imperial University, Tokyo, today's Tokyo University to teach, uh, he taught interesting um, uh, political science, economics, and a little bit of philosophy. He was not quite a philosophy professor, but he did teach Hegel in English translation. So Hegel became rather important in Japan, thanks to whatever, well, thanks, I don't know, thanks to Fenarosa. <laughs> okay, but Fenarosa lost interest in these uh, disciplines as soon as he uh, discovered the beauty, the wealth of Japanese art, traditional art, which were denigrated, which were sold with pennies, pittance, because everybody thought Japanese art is passé. From now on, European art is going to be the way. And Fenarosa said, uh, More, just a moment, take your time. Don't, in, don't be in a hurry to discard the beauty, the treasure that you have. And he warned Japanese um, important people as well as rich people who were able to collect and protect Japanese arts to stop and think and uh, reappreciate Japanese art. Mm -hmm. well, uh, And he, as a collector, was extremely successful. And he uh, bought with, song, uh, with a song, I suppose, uh, very cheaply, some of the incredibly important works. And he took them to Boston, eventually. And he was able to sustain his uh, luxurious lifestyle for the rest of his life. So he knew what he was talking about. OK, <laughs> never mind. All right. And now, um, he, the, the, the most important lecture he gave was given in Meiji the 15th, 15th year of Meiji, which is 1882. And it's entitled, The True Meaning of Fine Art, Bijutsu Shinsetsu. 
uh, in which he, talked, he introduced some new vocabulary to talk about art. So that's important in that. It's the beginning of the kind of aesthetics. But also, uh, he advocated the merits of Japanese paintings o o over against the Western oil paintings. And uh, that's the, his contribution. So he, he said two things, Japanese, Japanese paintings are really fine, but it could improve in these two areas. One, use more color. Two, adapt contrast, like a light and shape or shading. So now, just to show you the, the, in a sense, how Japanese painters were responsible, responsive, ex excuse me, they were heeding Fenelosa's uh, suggestions. So this side, right side, is Fenelosa, the artist discovered by Fenelosa. The other side is the traditional master. And they're both coming from the Kano school of teaching, I mean painting. So the ver very first one is Kano Tanyu, a dragon, Ryuzu. 1662, yes. So you can see the use of color already in Japanese paintings. And that was a, a new, in a sense, uh, uh, direction they were taking. And this is the Kano Hogai's very famous uh, Hibo Kano, the compassionate Kano. And he finished this five days before he died. And if you see the painting uh, carefully, the, the Guang in the goddess, the go goddess of mercy, she's pouring the water of life. And there is the little baby in the mother's womb looking up to this loving mother. And the whole thing is done in such a dreamy way. And there is a story behind this, but I'm not going to go into it. But you can see there is something very new from the traditional religious paintings. Eh? Now, there is a very interesting mis uh, case of mistranslation. Often we translate, and sometimes we mistranslate. But, and sometimes it turns out to be a good one, good mistranslation. <laughs> and it, it happened in this case. And I am saying, Nishitani Keiji, he says, actually, goyaku, goyaku is bad translation, mistake. Goyaku is good, he says. We are not to disparage because it can give birth to something new, some new imagery or some new directions. So in the end, they could be fruitful, so don't be afraid. So that's the first thing. So maybe it's a fortunate mistransform <laughs> mistranslation. And I'm talking about en plein air or in the open air, the concept. Uh, 
And this method was uh, enabled by the paints coming in, in tube forms. So you could take them with you to the open air and start painting. So there was the kind of a te technological evolution, but also the mo uh, move to at outdoor to paint what you're looking at. And that began to be practiced by the 19th century Western painter, painters, such as Fre French impressionists like Monet and so on. So the original meaning of en plein air means to paint a work outdoors. However, Japanese professors and some of the uh, Fueba teachers, <laughs> they didn't understand this concept. They literally translated paint the air, paint air, right? They didn't take on very specially, uh, seriously. So they said, you have to capture the air, the atmosphere. You have to capture this transparent quality. You have to study air. <laughs> But uh, the Tenshin never said this. He would not make this kind of mistakes. I think he should be not grouped in this kind of. But very interestingly, uh, I was watching on a PBS program the other day decoding the uh, Da Vinci. It is uh, the method, painting method Da Vinci was developing. And I began to see many parallels between the, these modern Japanese painters and Da Vinci. And Da Vinci actually studied air and how distance changes the color, and so on. So it's not something stupid in a way. So I just wanted to mention that, yes? Bueno, este es un concepto que también lo tomaba, por ejemplo, Da Vinci, que él, él en realidad se estudiaba como la influencia de la distancia hacía, notaba cambios en el color. O sea, no es, no es tan bizarro que digamos esto. So now I move on to this uh, um, piece called Kaiga uh, Nitsuite, or on the art of paintings or on painting. That was a manifesto by Shunso and Taikan, two of uh, Tenshin's uh, students who returned to Japan after their two years of uh, sojourn abroad. And this was written in 1905, and this is important because that's, that's the year Japan won, became victorious of the uh, Russo-Japanese war, and that shocked the entire global world. And also, another important point is that the, this notion of nationalism, Japan is superior, or whatever, was yet to sprout. So now here you see pre-nationalistic attitude of the Japanese painters who nevertheless talk about what it means to be a Japanese or Japanese people. And there are quite a few points here, so I'm going to go very quickly because I think it's rather important that I share this with you. And I still have 52 plus 20, 72 minutes, okay? <laughs> so I think I can do this, yeah? So uh, I'm just uh, making bullet points, okay? And because their writing was very flamboyant, Meiji Japanese, impossible to decode. So I, I'm now making very simplified uh, uh, integrity language as opposed to intimacy, intimacy language and see how we may clarify some of the points. Okay, number one. Art is the manifestation of the inner life of the artist, him or herself. Manifestación artística de la vida íntima del artista. 
es no, ahora. El arte es la manifestación sí. eh, de la vida íntima de la Artist, artistic technique is but a means of self-expression. It follows then that if artists diligently cultivate their inner selves, the method of arti artistic expression ought to be left to the artists and no one's, no one's business, but artists' own business. Eh, esto sigue que el artista se cultiva a, a él mismo a, en su interior, a su interior y que el método del artista expresa eh, el, el método de, de la expresión artística lo que, lo que deja es la expresión del mismo artista. Second, the sole, uh, guided, okay, the sole guiding principle for the painters is to depict what flows out, out, what flows out from within the inner life of the artist. It's not something that one sees, but something that flows out from the artist, him or herself. And that's the task for painters to paint. The task of the principle of the painting is that demuestre o que salga lo que, vi, lo que está en el interior del artista. So, the third, they talk about the uh, appellation, you know, Jan, Japanese painting or Nihonga, that does not refer to a specific Jan, but rather it designates the outflow of the state, uni uniquely of the Japanese or people, but he doesn't use the word Japanese. Uh, they don't use the word Japanese. They use Yamato people, Yamato Minzoku. Yamato Minzoku, that uh, something is very taste uniquely to Yamato Minzok. And that is the genre that we may call Japanese painting. Eh, bueno, se le dice pintura japonesa, el, el nihonga, pero no se refiere específicamente a un género, sino solo eh, como algunas, algunos rasgos de este, eh, como de este, eh, de este como de este, Unique, único. de esta única uh, forma de ser, este, que, para, que era diferente a los este, occidentales. Es so, decir que la, es, no es una técnica que se, es como un, al, algunos elementos que adoptan en nueva eh, técnica. So it's, uh, it's to do with ethnicity and art. They're referring to that. They don't have that vocabulary, but that's what they're doing. Therefore, to distinguish Eastern and Western paintings by way of the kinds of pigments or technique adapted is pointless. Next, to copy nature faithfully in art is not the ultimate object of art or objective of art. If that were the case, nature would be the greatest artist. <laughs> so, next one. Art aims at expressing over and beyond nature. So, this is a continuation of the last point. Entonces, la continuación del, del punto anterior sería, el arte busca expresar por encima y más allá de la naturaleza. The life of painting consists in evoking fantasy and imagination in the minds of the viewers. Mere realistic re representation of nature cannot fulfill this function. La vida de, de la pintura consiste en que pueda evocar fantasía e imaginación en la mente de los observadores, eh, no la mera representación real de la naturaleza que no, no se llena esta función. Certainly, we find the tradition of realism in the East too. Realistic depiction of nature is not the uh, prerogative of Western painting at all. Realismo de, eh, eh, 
eh, el realismo no es solo plantear a la naturaleza, representar a la naturaleza eh, la única eh, objetivo en Occidente. So, realistic and objective depiction of a thing is only the gateway to painting, whose real goal, moreover, is to realize the ideals that are in the mind or minds of the artists. Así, el realismo y el, objeti el objetivismo eh, revela que no es, es, ellos son solo la puerta de entrada en la pintura, donde su objetivo principal será que eh, la, la develación de los ideales de la mente del artista. The conventional distinction between realism and idealism breaks down. Entonces, la, conven la convencional distinción que tenemos entre realismo e idealismo se rompe. Mm, this is the ace. Now we are moving on to the heart of the argument. Color is of the central importance in painting. This does not mean the artists imitate, for example, some of the uh, traditional decorative art. Bueno, ahora vamos al corazón del argumento, el color. El color es el aspecto importante en la pintura. No quiere decir que los artistas imiten a los colores de Corin. En su This is Corin's uh, famous uh, irises. So, how, number nine, how to express the form, katachi of a thing by the use of color, iro, is at the heart of the painting. And here you start to hear the overtone of shikisoku zeku, kusoku zeshiki, the very profound uh, Buddhist uh, worldview. Este, tiene, una, tiene un significado profundo también del budismo. Y el Namaru está en la misma pronunciación del budismo. Yeah. Here, the artists are talking. Here, we have been experimenting with the technique of outlinelessness by substituting the outline with color. Estamos aquí. Eh, experimentando la, eh, fuera de la línea, sustituyendo la línea con color. And in Japanese, it's a technical term is shikiteki mokkotsu o iro mokkotsu. Este, este tipo de técnica pues tiene un nombre en japonés. And now, even talking about the monochrome paintings, uh, it's, it is said that there are five colors in the ink, sumini gosai ari. Hablando sobre la pintura en tinta china, se dice que hay cinco colores en la tinta. And you can see five different colors in this. Same, uh, this is by Hakuin. Hakuin's uh, painting. Aquí vemos la pintura de Hakuin, este, se distinguen cinco colores. So it means that painters do not, do not paint color, but rather painters draw the color. That's a very strange way of saying. Entonces, eh, vemos como eh, el pintor no pinta colores, sino que dibuja el color. Eleven, lines are compared to delimitation. Line is limited. While the actual thing has no limit. Uh, we try to depict this eternal quality of life with the use of color instead of lines. Las líneas son, este, bueno, las podemos comparar con una delimitación cuando en realidad no hay límites. Estamos hablando de una, eh, una, una vida, la cualidad eterna de la vida el, con el uso del color en, en lugar de las líneas. The true value of Corin's, uh, the true value of Corin's contribution to paintings is that he revived the use of color, colored lines that were used in the old painting techniques of the ancient times going back to the Genji story uh, scrolls. In other words, these painters were not just painting, they were studying and painting at the same time. Next, the climate 
Fudo. Raquel has talked about Fudo. The climate of each country influences the dwellers of the land, which goes without saying. Thus, each of us wants to take one's own road. We want to take our own road. How could we imitate arts of the foreign lands without feeling ashamed? So that was the reason for them to be developing new techniques and new materials and new painting pigments and so on. So now I move on to 15. The life of painters. Just a moment. Okay. The life of painters lies in our actual technique to ex execute the painting. In other words, even if we are deep philosophers, if we don't have the te technical know-how, we are, we are not doing it. So we need both. In order to achieve this, uh, deepening our experience is paramount. For this purpose, we shall produce many paintings and put them to the public, to your criticism. This is where the uh, role of publicum, public, comes in. Our aim will of itself clarify, will be clarified in this process. So they are very conscious of the public. So this is a kind of a rare look into artists' own endeavor, which I find very precious or priceless. <laughs> okay, so next, let's move on. Okay, now this is Nishida's letter to his dear friend uh, Fujioka. Fujioka published this Kinsei Kaigashi in July 1903, and uh, uh, Nishida responded right away. This is just to say, he, this is from the Papa. The present book is a work that covers the lineages of artists as the emphasis is placed on their bio, biographical information. Instead of on the discussion of paintings themselves and how the painting style changed and evolved in time. I personally would have liked to see more detailed critical study of paintings rather than of the artists. So, you know, I think Fujioka was uh, still kind of uh, following the traditional way of introducing paintings by the painters' lives. And Nishida is saying, would you please more talk about the techniques that they were developing and uh, so on. So I'm going to go into it because this does show Nishida's philosophical approach. And I think this is easy to follow because he's talking to his friend. And, but he's talking about his own concerns for methodology in doing philosophy. So now I just quote. This is a translation of Nishida's letter that I made. Okay? This, Please discuss the technical execution, such as the use of the brush, how you use the brush, the color, and so on in major schools that constituted Japanese painting as a genre. You could make a comparative study of each school, see how ideas changed, and see whether or not such attempts were successful. And uh, his uh, point 
Yeah, his point is that I wish you, Fujioka, I wish you to see. No, what I want to see in you is that you organize your thoughts and establish a field of study, aesthetics or critique of art, hmm? uh, by reading up on Western treaty, treaties on paintings, aesthetics, and so forth. So these are two main points that Nishida is concerned. So more in the con oops. <laughs> I think some some pp some pages were missing. Okay. So then I have to do it. I have to read. Sorry because this is rather important. Okay. So now Nishida goes into the detail. Group the paintings according to the subject matter, like uh, natural paintings or portraits or city scenes or whatever. So group the paintings according to the subject matter. For instance, that's something you could think about. <laughs> Then analyze the different, different depths of the uh, ideals that each artist tries to depict and pass judgment as to which artists excel, which, uh, excel which others, and uh, add an aesthetic reasoning to explain why you make such a judgment. You must make a judgment. Which painter succeeded better and why? And it's interesting that Nishida uses the word fukasa, depths of the ideas. Uh, they want to depict something in their, ide their ideas. How deeply did they go in? And how successful were they? Yeah. These were the first questions he was asking. Second, yeah? Here may be uh, work done by Lessing called Lao Kong may be useful because the uh, author made a detailed analysis of how the sculptor made his study into depicting suffering and pain. Take one painter at a time, for example, and analyze the the philosophy, uh, the, analyze the philosophy of the artist from uh, any angle, and then put all the painters together that you chose them in a chronological perspective to see the process of, and the transformation of art, if there is any. And uh, finally, I already quoted, uh, discuss the techni technical execution, the use of brush, the color, and so on. So those were his uh, points to Fujioka. Yeah, yeah. Now uh, he excuses himself, and I'm so sorry it's not in here. I'm glad I had the printed copy here. I know full well that you know the subject really profoundly, so what I wish to see is that you make the systematic uh, approach. Next. Um, uh, until now, in Japan, the discussion of paintings is done either from the perspective of the appraiser who uh, puts a price, you know, value to the thing, or collector, or that of the individual intuition uh, that is based on the subjective feeling. 
but, but both approaches lack conceptual analysis. Actualmente en Japón, bueno, necesito que organices este, cómo, cómo estableces el parámetro para apreciar la pintura desde una manera eh, estética que también sea analítica. ¿Por qué? Porque en Japón solo se ha analizado desde el, el comprador o desde una perspectiva intuitiva. Entonces no, ten, no hemos tenido una una aproximación de análisis conceptual. So this kind of uh, attitude renders the discussion empty and scholarly futile. Pero pues eso entonces son discusiones vacías, no tiene el contenido realmente. So that is his first uh, request. Next one. The terminology adapted in the discussion is often vague. It's the critique, criticism of traditional terminologies. La segunda parte es una crítica sobre la terminología en la que están, están descritas, porque se expresa un poco vaga. Such as, shin in hyo byo, as in poetry, which means a, a very refined tone. This poet, poem has a very refined tone, but we should please explain. That's the point. Dice porque a veces hay expresiones como muy vagas, como en la poesía. Esto tiene un tono muy definido, pero por favor explicar qué es eso de un tono muy definido. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it does not help the reader to understand the point that you try to make and communicate. So the need for new terminology, I think that is needed as a really big point. La necesidad de una nueva terminología, ese es el asunto principal de Nishida. Now he is realistic as to what can be achieved by one person. So he says, the field of the history of Japanese paintings as an academic discipline is probably too large for a single scholar to establish. Take, for example, Sesshu. A truly scholarly analysis of even one artist would not be done easily. Pero ana, eh, analizar todas las pinturas japonesas en, como una disciplina académica tal vez sea demasiado para una sola persona, porque no tomas, por ejemplo, a Seishu para que te ayude como para hacer un verdadero análisis que una sola persona no puede llevar a cabo fácilmente. So, it's like uh, academic work also needs a team to be working together to do something more efficient. Okay. Be that as it may, your work is a great contribution for the younger generation of scholars. Contribution for the younger Gracias. students. And then uh, we, uh, I already quoted that uh, paintings, just as literature, are expressions of the thoughts and the time. And now Nishida, of course, doesn't want to lose his good friend, so he's very nice at the very end. Hmm? I really enjoyed going through your book as it is full of interesting information, but there is something more to be desired as a seriously scholarly work. Please pardon me for my utter uncouth wild words. Now, very briefly, because literature was mentioned, and Natsume Soseki actually uh, wrote quite a lot on, uh, how to, uh, on the movement of modern paintings and so on. And he actually uh, wrote this very extensive review of one of the uh, exhibitions of 1912. And this is Soseki's own philosophy arriving at this uh, kind of uh, clarity. And he said, 
芸術は自己の表現に始まって自己の表現に終わる Art begins with self-expression and ends in self-expression of the artist He's talking about himself as a novelist. So you can see there is a kind of a zeitgeist that runs through Nishida, Soseki, or the disciples of、uh, painting, modern Japanese paintings, because there was a little bit of an emphasis on critical self reflection, and that was really、uh, paramount. <coughs> Okay, now I want to go into more exciting parts, which is the technical detail. <laughs> you would say no, and I say yes, <laughs> because now I'm going to talk about the cat's tail and see if you can open up your mind. So, next time you go visit a Japanese、uh, painting exhibition, you know perhaps what to pay attention. I still have 26, 46 minutes.、Uh, do you want me to cut it short? Entonces, ahora voy a hablar sobre la técnica. Y ustedes van a decir, no, pero sí, para que cuando vayan a, a ver algunas muestras de arte de, eh, eh, de arte japonés, puedan ver. Voy a hablar sobre la cola del gato. So, now, now this is the very famous、uh, painting by Shunso called Black Cat. And done in 1910, and he dies, I think, the next year. So, he, this is one of the last works.、Yeah? And he said,、uh, It's the second in ranking in terms of national treasure. Entonces, esta obra es,、eh, es Shunso. Es de Shunso. Shunso.、Mm -hmm. eh, es tesoro nacional. Es, es de, está rankeada dentro de, los,、eh, de las obras de, de tesoro nacional. Now, these are just to give you some directions as to what to pay attention to. I just chose five out of possibly. 20 or 30 techniques that artists employ. But these are very important, very easy to recognize. One, outline, outline lessness. Outline, there is no outline. <laughs> <laughs> Contour. Two, use of colored lines instead. So, you can see, you, be, you can begin to see that actually cat has no contour.、Mm -hmm. Three blurring effect. When you have no contour, it be begins to achieve this blurring effect, which kind of merges into background or emerges from the background. And then this is called in Japanese nijimi technique. Nijimu is to kind of you know, seep into paper. Or tarashikomi, you just、uh, drop a paint and then it starts to develop into some sort of pattern. This is a technique in Japanese that it disperses the image. And the, uh, the uh, result achieved by this kind of technique was ridiculed as moral style. Moral means ghostly. There is no bone. It's just、uh, no substance. And then another technique that they love to employ was what's called urahaku. That is to use, you、uh, employ gold or silver leaves and you paste them on the back side of the silk. As cameras. They use silk quite a lot because of this penetration that you can see the background, and then you can see this lighting reflecting on the canvas. So that's what's called urahaku.
hojas de oro y plata para que se reflejara en la, en la imagen que se estaba pintando. Entonces, usar el reverso, el, el lado reverso, para, eh, para pintar sobre la zona. And also, they liberally used gold and silver, you know, taking from natural uh, 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 minerals. So we call them konde ginde, you know, dirt, they means mud, <laughs> gold mud, silver mud. But anyway, these are very interesting. But these are technical. But I think now they are giving us some points to pay attention to so that we begin to expand our awareness. And I'm very grateful that some people actually did this for, for us. Bueno, este, en estos puntos nos empiezan a dar eh, una señal de otras, eh, una manera de lograr los objetivos lo hicieron. So now you can start to see what kind of technique was used. And I'm especially going to talk about this because it's kind of conspicuous. And also these. And here, uh, what do you think he, what technique do you think he used to paint the tail, cat's tail? Huh? Did he use outline? No. No, no. No, no. Yeah. And did he paint in one stroke? Or do you think he might have actually applied many, many fine strokes over and over to achieve this kind of uh, volume? Fine, really fine, fine, fine lines were drawn over and over and over. And they, he also used the nijimi, the blurring technique here. So he would wet the canvas, and then he would start really by fine stroke, brush stroke, and until he achieved the thing that's coming into life. And what do you think he used for the eyes? Huh? Gold, gold, gold specs. Yes, absolutely. So you, it shines. It literally shines. So now you start to see, and uh, some parts, these are the things that he actually used lines, OK? The hair inside. The year. <laughs> but when you start to look at things like this, it's really interesting. And the cat starts to kind of assume its presence. <laughs> now, this is another, uh, yeah, yeah. I will show that again. This is another uh, example of uh, lineless or outlineless uh, painting, and the color was used instead. And this is one of the very first beginning by uh, Shunso. And the title is called Oshokun. It's a very famous Chinese uh, story, historical story. There was a very beautiful courtesan in the emperor's court. And one time, uh, somebody from a barbaric country, the king wanted to marry one of the concubines. So King says, I don't know. Emperor says, I don't know which one I want to give. <laughs> OK, I have an idea. Why don't you, each of you, have a painter paint your paintings, OK? Portrait, and I'll choose the ugliest. <laughs> 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 And so it happens, this Oshokun, she was a beauty. And she knew. So she didn't pay the painter, you know, some money to paint her beautifully. <laughs> No le pago para que, o sea, le pago para que no la, no 
So now you know the end of the story, right? She was chosen <laughs> to get, you know, get go out of his, uh, uh, you know, harem and uh, marry this barbaric uh, whoever king. So here is the lady and the lady in waiting, lamenting this unexpected fate of this beauty, beautiful woman. Anyway, uh, Shunso chose this theme and made this kind of very, almost phantasmic kind of a painting. And this is now a national treasure. Another hazy style, if you like, of ghostly painting is by Yokoyama Taika, and this is Laozu, entitled Laozu. And you can see uh, there is a kind of a luminosity in there. Next one, this is the use of lining uh, behind the silk canvas. And this is what's called, uh, I think, uh, uh, clouds or something, lightning clouds or something, by Yokoyama Taikan. And I'll show you one, and I'll, I'll show you another one. Same painting. In this case, he used silver. Now, under different lighting, this is the same picture. See? Completely different. It achieves the effect that is more than, in a sense, a painting. So it, the title is Kumo Kyorai, Cloud, Come and Go. Kyorai Suru is the come and go, life. It's the metaphor of life. And he was inspired to paint this painting when he had a picnic, he and his friends, at Lake Biwa, the big, big uh, lake near Kyoto. At that time, the sky darkened all of a sudden, and the thunderstorm began. <laughs> <laughs> and the rain, you know. And he said, this is so interesting. I'm going to paint this. <laughs> so that's the result. So once you know all the stories and technique, uh, the painting comes to life, you know. You know? Do you agree? So now I wanted to bring in Leonardo da Vinci once again, because this uh, program I was watching, they mentioned the word sfumato, sfumato. Fuma, fuma, fumo is smoke. And s if you put s in front of any Italian word, it becomes a verb. Sfumato, to smoke. <laughs> and then, so actually sfumare is shade, hue, gradation. And sfumato was, uh, this word was uh, invented to describe the um, enig enigmatic smile of Mona Lisa. And if you look at it, there is no outline. No edge. Apparently, Da Vinci used his brushwork uh, to do this uh, uh, lip, you know, the famous lips. And he applied more than 30 layers of paint gradually <coughs> to achieve this effect. And now you know what I'm thinking, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And also, interesting thing about uh, Da Vinci's uh, paintings uh, is that uh, they made x-rays of those paintings. And when you do the x-ray, all the figures in the front disappear, only the background. Yes, because of the very technique that he used. Uh, figures were not drawn <laughs> in as an outline. As opposed to Raffaello, for example, he drew outlines and then he filled lines with color. So if you take an x ray of Raffaello's paintings, you see the figure. So, to me, it's like life emerging out of something. Yes, it's not, it's not like we are depicting it, but it's coming, coming into me. That's why it's an it's a enigma forever. We cannot penetrate, no? The Mona, Mona Lisa. So now this is how the explanation reads. In case uh, you want to study more, there were quite a few examples. So I just wanted to share you that. And here again, so now you know it's an old, old cat for you by now, right? <laughs> OK, fine. That's very good. So now at least I communicated something to you, I think. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to dwell on this one particular painting. Another one. This is the tree on which the cat is sitting. Does it have outline? No, right? And you can start to wonder what kind of technique the artist used. Next uh, example is the use of gold pigments. It's like uh, imitating, in a sense, Corinne's decorative art. And he applied that also. That means uh, I have half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, excuse me. The third is the example of actually using, actively using the effect of blurring. As you use water, you apply water first to canvas and then you apply the color and it starts to blur. And that's how he left empty space in between for it to happen. So I'm very excited that at least finally some veil that stopped me from really reaching out seems to be falling down. <laughs> So now uh, I need to conclude. And I think I had extra slides, but I think I was working too early in the morning or too late at night. So they seem to be misplaced. So my point was that uh, I don't think I put it in here, but I think in Nishida, he thought it's important for us to have a semantic approach to anything we are working on. Be it painting, or be it critique, or painting, or uh, what, uh, in philosophy, semantic. Second, uh, he considered, considered it paramount that we must analyze and explain. And the third point is that uh, uh, we need to have a set of new vocabulary to speak about this kind of uh, a new approach. So let me read just one paragraph which, in which I kind of reflected on this uh, 
zeitgeist of the time, 1910s. For Nishida, scholarly or academic work meant universally accessible. Scholarly meant universally accessible. Regardless of, of one's ethnic origin, nationality, gender, class, if you are a Marxist, <laughs> or cultural environment, or food we eat. This uh, academic work, uh, universally accessible, it is uh, enabled by the power of human mind that can understand and unravel the unfamiliar, the foreign, the other. Just like I was able to understand Japanese paintings, the other now is not so other. And I think that's what Nishida was trying to do in his uh, 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 philosophical work. Uh, that is the prerequisite for entering. This kind of thing is the prerequisite for entering into any dialogue with the other. And this dialogue is needed more than ever today, not only in the philosophical world, but in addressing climate change and the world, worldwide corruption of those who are in power. We used to call the, uh, those who engage in watching, oh, it, okay, we used to call politicians they're watching over for us. Now we know that uh, those are politicians who are driven by their greed and profit. We need it more. We had big problems like uh, climate change. So we need, in a sense, to trust the power of our mind, discrimination, so that we can shift the correct from the incorrect, truth from lies. So now, uh, this is my conclusion in a kind of a poetic way. I try to make it uh, in a short way. Have audacity to experiment without betraying the tra tradition that has nurtured you. Without betraying your tradition, without negating your tradition. Clarify and explain as much as you can your own experience and perception in words or in representations. That will have its universality to communicate to the others and the power to move the other. Eso nos dará, es, 
Now I want to conclude my presentation with the very famous uh, Nishida's, uh, uh, how do you say? It never gets old. Uh, the significance gets more and more clear to me. The, these words. There is no denying that we have much to admire and learn from the brilliant developments of Western cultures, which took form as the actual reality and becoming as good. At the same time, I think at the depths of Eastern cultures, which have nurtured our ancestors for thousands of years, there is the kind of awareness that sees the form of the formless and hears the voice of the voiceless. Our hearts do not cease to yearn for this kind of reality. I want to attempt to give a philosophical foundation to such demand. Thank you. So I don't know how to start, but I just I'm just going to uh, pick a few things that hit me, especially when you talk about how Tenshin was uh, interested in making disciples to see, to actually see, and how you relate that to uh, watching the in between and painting the ineffable. So does this mean that the in between and painting the, the ineffable is to be intimate, to use a word from the previous presentation, or to get close with the materiality and the pigments and, and, and all the, the things that go in, in the methodology or how to do the technique of painting, that this immaterial thing that we usually think is the, the ineffable is actually something that is very close to materiality. Yes. Uh, you know, my thesis is this. We have logos. We have mythos, and logos dominated the last 200 set years, say. Descartes and uh, Hegel and you know, Kant and all the way down to today, an analytic philosophy. Mythos died in that process. We are not listening to other kinds of voice, which is also part of language, yes? So, yeah, so um, my proposal is that we need to recover logos, and in order to recover logos in its fullness, fullness, we need to recover mythos. In other words, there is no logos without mythos, without, there is no true rationality without this awareness of the something we cannot even talk about. What are we talking about? We are thinking, still in the process, and we want to say something. And then artists take one way, we take another way. But I think that origin of ideas, uh, image, is so vital. And we have forgotten to listen and watch and see. So I feel that uh, uh, this is a project I feel very important for us, because in Japan, we don't have any myth anymore because it was abused during World War II in, you know, in the campaign. So still we have allergy. If uh, someone talks about some goddess, we say, oh, stop it. <laughs> we don't want it. Yes? So logos and mythos is very vulnerable. And we need to come up with a new way to talk about things in a non-dualistic way. In as far as we keep on dualizing, making 
opposites. Like, we are here, environment there, I'm here, nature there. No. I am nature. I am basho. I am topos. I am the place. But I'm not in the place. I am in the place, but I am the place. Because I include you now. I listen, and my parameter all of a sudden moves to include you, your ideas, and so on. So it's a constant, you know, this kind of movement. It shrinks, and then it, it expands. And in compassion, it forever expands, no? You can imagine. So it seems to me that even the idea of Thomas, uh, Basho, it has to be reconceived. And somehow we tend to objectify, because that's the nature of logos centered language. But if we inject mythos into it, perhaps something else might come. And that's why I love artists. They're doing that. And I would like to ask you about some kind of movement, of an artistic movement that is really really powerful today in Western culture, that is the so-called hyperrealism, that has the only object to imitate reality in the most reality in the most realism way possible. I can see that Eastern culture doesn't have that notion in mind. So what's the conception of the Eastern culture about this hyperrealism? Um, I think there is already a contradiction in, the, in terms. Imitate reality in the most uh, real way. You already take, take for granted that there is something real. Yeah, well, no, it's not true. In, it's not true. There is nothing to imitate. And so I think we, you see, we all have this mindset, which is subject-object, because it, we cannot help it. You know, language is like that. But we can go beyond and somehow that, is, that comes with opening of a certain kind. I don't know how it comes, but it does come. And they, the world seems to fall into better uh, place in some way. Everything starts to make sense without contradicting. And hyper this, hyper that, I don't think so. Because we have to go super hyper. After super hyper, what comes? So we need to go back the other way, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think so, because in Western culture, we need to have some kind of objective reality. Yeah. And in the Eastern culture, so there's nothing like that. Yes, there is in the East too. But, so I hate to divide between East and West, mm -hmm. but I think there are two kinds of mentalities that doesn't matter whether you are Eastern or Western. But some people, by nature, have more inclination to understand one way than the other, like a native, you know, Americans, or, you know, Australian Aboriginal people, and so. In, in Japan, in fact, you don't find this uh, uh, mythic mentality anymore because of modernity. You know, everything becomes so standardized. So I think we are all in the same boat. And then, what can we do? from thinking all together. Isn't that a point? Maybe? Unless we want to think and swim again. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the uh, presentation. Um, first of all, this is the side of uh, Nishida that uh, is not very much talked about. And I think it's important that we also discuss uh, this as well. So thank you very much for this. Um, I have a very um, tiny question. Uh, you mentioned uh, at some point Nishitani and how uh, a wrong translation can yes. um, be to something new, can be fruitful. And you gave the example of uh, en plein air, the, in the open air. And my question was very simple. Uh, what's the wrong translation for that? In Japan? What, what is the Japanese term that we use to render this uh, en plein air? Um, Kūki wo egake. So Kūki wo egake. Depict air. Thank you. Por cierto, ya no vamos a poder hacer más preguntas. Lo lamentamos mucho, pero bueno, muchas gracias a la doctora Luisa, a la doctora, y pues. Thank you so much for coming.